Hi and welcome. We're going to have a good look at Rosemary's Waltz by Richard Rodney Bennett. It's a wonderful piece, a bit of film music. I didn't know it before it appeared on the exam syllabus. There's always things to discover. Let's dive in. The first thing to practice might be to look at perfect cadences, 5-1 cadences. This piece is littered with them. It's part of the jazz idiom. So, 5-1 in C major, chord 5, G to chord 1, C. Chord 5, let's put the 3rd and the 7th in and notice how they will naturally do that. Hmm, okay. How about in D flat major? How about in D major? Now, what time we get to D major? One of these notes is now very definitely above, but both of them are above middle C. A good ground rule is that have one of the notes either side of middle C. That'll put the chord in the right place. So I'm just going to chuck the G down an octave. And notice how now those notes fan out. That's D major. How about an E flat major? E major. F major. G flat major, G major. And I'm about to get to the point where, yeah, I'm getting a bit too high there, aren't I? What are you Yeah, and on you go. Just work your way through a 5 1 cadences. Now then, I'm going to go through the piece nice and steadily, both hands from the offset, and uh, we will encounter all sorts of things as we go. That is the little idea that runs through this entire piece, is built on that. That sort of six note figure. And then he changes it. Ooh. So let's just keep going, playing through the melody. Ooh. I'm gonna keep going for now. Relaxed hand, that's why I do that wobbly thing. And then we start a slightly different section there. And notice how I was using the exact same fingering that I would do, that I will do, when I'm playing all the other notes as well. I think that's important as part of the learning process. Um, and quite often, we have to do a 5-4 thing. 5-4 is not easy. You could try a chromatic one. Ooh. Try coming down. Yeah, that feels as if it's doing a bit of good there. And then, if we're going to add in some other notes there, holding on to the B. Little hop of the thumb. I'm holding on to both of those to That's tricky. And I'm not using any pedal at this point. I'm having to do all the work with the fingers. A point I make often. <laughs> it's a lovely augmented chord. I'll explain it a bit more in a moment. Let's add in the left hand to that. Very, very steady, no pedal at all. I'm very tempted to add the pedal.
So that's an awkward passage, that bit, holding on to those two at the bottom. Those chords really together. Growing. And on that phrase as well, that 5-4 that we've spoken of, make sure that there is tone on the fifth and the fifth fingers. You might end up with a sort of uneven thing going on. Listen out for the melody, that's why you've got to know the melody first. Sorry, I'll go to the middle of that bar. The melody is king. Hope I'm giving a bit more weight to the E there. Oops, oops. That didn't work. That chord is a lovely. What's sounding good about it is we've got a sharp nine, sharp five. Sharp five, sharp nine, it's an F dominant seventh chord. That is a, a standard voicing for that chord. And that progression we're going to come back to at the end. We're landing on a G chord there, aren't we? But we're landing first of all on a G diminished. We're delaying the resolution. G diminished to G. It's a very common way of delaying resolution. Um, if I just, for a split second, let's go to C major. C. Perfect cadence in C. One way of delaying that would be to do Another way might be to, instead of landing on a C, to land on a C diminished before we get to our C chord. It's not that, that's what he's using here. Now the pedal, there needs to be not too much of it so that that melody sings out, uh, not too much blurring of the lines. Now there's pedaling markings in the score, so let me go through now, nice and steady. I know you can't see my feet, but I'll try and describe it as best I can. Down, up, down, and when I say down, it's just after I've played the notes. If I play it too exactly as I play the note, there's a danger, I'm going to clip, I'm going to keep hold of the D from just before. I'm playing legato, so that D is still sort of, yeah. Down. No pedal for this bar. Same idea for that one. I should add, of course, all pedaling is, is very subjective. It's to do with the room you're in, the instrument you're on. And it's, it re really listen. Uh, when you have an idea of what you want, the pedaling will hopefully make sense. Um, off from the beginning again. Up, down, no pedal. Light dabs here. Now, uh, for all of that, that second line, very subtle, light dabs going on. how you can't hear that A flat or that uh, A natural or the G flat because the pedal's not doing that. I want you to hear the crunch and clarity in the top line. Again. Ah, horrible. So there is a clean resolution there. Um, 
it is difficult to describe the pedaling. Um, I could try putting a camera down there, but uh, I'm not going to go there for now. Now this next section, we've got this sort of constant, pretty much flow of quavers going on in our right hand. And whereas the first bit that I've, we've played through so far has been in a small register of the keyboard, we're now going to be going over a sort of two octave plus bit. So, you know when we first learn arpeggios, we tend to do... Oh, can I get it smooth round to there thing? Which involves quite a lot of... Ooh, twisting of the hand, thumb goes under. Hmm. I put it to you that at speed, this isn't really fast, but we don't always want to do that. It's more of a shooting across. It's more of that kind of motion, less of a that kind of motion. Yeah. So, um, this particular, this first um, first arpeggio-like figure. So the not going under, but just coming across the piano, across the keyboard. I would practice this. Can my hand get used to going from one to the other? The E in the middle third finger, the D in the middle with the second finger. Ah! <laughs> well, I'm pleased I managed to do that. It might easily have gone wrong. Um, so let's put the other hand in as well, nice and steady. And this section, it is ultimately going to go a little bit faster and the next line and a half is going to gradually grow, isn't it? Let's think it through. Pedal with each bar. Yeah, more more pedal for this section. That's a bit flaffy, isn't it? But it's perfectly possible. So the left hand, you've got to know your chords. I would urge you to analyse them. I'm not going to write up exactly what they are here, but why don't you write under them what they are? Have a think about it. Um, and then when you've got the harmonic progression in your head and you know the chords, it will be easier. And the bass note is our double bass player. Can we have a good tone? E flat dominant seven, A flat major seven, up there, sorry, B dominant seven, E, I'm gonna be quiet. Drill those chords, you've got to know where you're going, take them on their own. I'm gonna go from oh, bar 20 again. Gradually building. Notice how the tune is all based on that same idea from the start. Double bass. I quite like the second finger on that D sharp. But first, it does work really well as well. So let's go through that right hand section from the top of the page. Again, he's creating material out of that initial idea. And the E flat will be held by the pedal there. And that will involve a bit of a leap. Whatever fingering you go for at the end of the bar, end of the line, you're going to have a bit of a leap to get to the E chord. The sense of climbing down there, it's uh, getting quite calmer.
to that section in a minute. Let's go through it again, top of the page. Lots of pedal. And don't be tempted to go too fast on those upward arpeggios. Um, we're going at a practice speed here, but measure them precisely um, at this point in the in the learning process. Notice that chordal voicing, stack of fourths. just shifts the whole idea just up an octave there and then our left hand here has to be busier doesn't it mm, it says fifth in the edition not sure it's worth bothering with but you could do yeah perfectly possible G natural on that one Ending up in F. This is curious. I'm not key are we in. There's no key signature, but we're definitely not in C major. Um, we started off with ending a sort of G major -y thing going on. We've ended in F. And in the middle, he's all over the place exploring different chords. Isn't it wonderful? So let's go from bar 35 to 6 then 38. A bit of held on that B. So what's going on here? Well, again, finishing up with that lovely idea that we've seen before. Um, and we've ended up on an F chord, exactly the same thing we spoke about before. Instead of landing on an F chord, he's landing on a F diminished, which becomes an F chord. Diminished to F. That's a lovely phrase, that's using notes of the diminished scale. Kind of when a C dominant seventh, flat nine, sharp nine. It's a diminished scale. It's the same idea from the very beginning, now given in, in its position here. Gives those lovely crunches. Here we go again. And this ending in the right hand, hmm, it's the same diminished falling to a triad, isn't it? And he's very cleverly, he's got a five note pattern. And because it's a five note pattern, but there are three beats in the bar, it sort of feels slightly unsettled, feels slightly bumpy until we get to the last chord. Definitely drill that pattern, work out what it is. Diminished, becoming F major. Yeah, drill it till you know it off by heart. I'm sure I've gone off the end of the screen there, I'm sorry. And then work out what the, these chords are, <laughs> he says. And notice how this bumpy five note thing fits in with a three, four feel. Deliberately no pedal, nice and slow. Try counting. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Pianissimo at the end. I mentioned at the start 
it was a good idea to do five one cadences by way of a sort of mental warm up. And they are all over the place. Let me go from um, bar 20 and I'll just draw your attention to where they're happening. C chord thing. I'm hearing an A sus chord here. That sound. Which is gonna take us to, there's flat nine again. D minor to G. Chordal voicing. Okay, here we go. There's an E flat dominant seventh, which goes to, resolves to A flat. Now we're going to go for a B. Sorry, that's too loud, that note. B dominant seventh takes us to E. A B flat. <laughs> flat nine. A B flat dominant seventh takes us to E flat. A G dominant seventh takes us to C. And on it goes. So many of those sequences, and it carries on down bar four. Or less, in fact, I should have, I should have just carried on. Let me carry on. A flat dominant seventh goes to D flat. E dominant seventh goes to A. E flat and the flat nine there goes to A flat. C dominant seventh goes to F but via the diminished first of all. Um, it's quite interesting to pick up on the harmony that he's using and what's going on. The whole idea, the whole rationale for the composition is in that little bit there. And his clever use of harmony, jazz-inspired harmony, and I hope you feel you've, we've dug into it a little bit there, um, is terribly helpful. I'm now going to play it right the way through with pedal at a slow practice speed and I'm hope hopefully I'm thinking about everything that's going on uh, dynamics as well I'd urge you to put in the dynamics the expression the feeling of the piece even at a slow speed even from the outset because that'll save you time you know, why do notes first and then think of all the the way you play it as icing on a cake it doesn't work like that it's not that let's learn it right from the outset so nice and slow, pedal, here we go.
So it's a beautiful, lovely piece. Lots in it, lots of harmonic things to work out what's going on. How has he created this piece out of this tiny idea from the outset? And quite a lot of technical things to get our heads around as well. So held notes, big range of the keyboard for the right hand, arpeggios, thinking about how we do those. A few exercises as well thrown in. Enjoy the challenges that this presents. And any questions, come back to me. Take care. Bye-bye for now.